<laughs> uh, well, great. Um, that was awesome. Uh, I'm with you, Mike. I'm ready for kickoff now. Uh, I'll, I'll do a quick intro. Hi, uh, my name is Jordan Hyman. Uh, I, I am the uh, president for the um, board of directors for the Delhi Collegian Alumni Interest Group. Uh, really thrilled to be here, thrilled to kick this off. Uh, and, uh, and really thrilled to get everyone's feedback on today's panel, which, which we're really excited about. I just wanted to start a, a couple pieces of homework on our end uh, to say thanks, first of all, to uh, to Shar and to Melanie and everyone with the Alumni, As Alumni Association for letting us be part of today's uh, and this week's festivities. We're, we're super excited about it. Um, I wanted to thank uh, our panelists in advance. I won't spoil anything on, a, on the bios. Um, but wanted to thank everyone for participating. I think uh, everyone's in for a treat uh, today in terms of uh, our just wide diversity of perspectives and, and recollections uh, as all things Collegian and Penn State go. I uh, wanted to thank our moderator, Jade Campos, who's the current editor-in-chief at the Delhi Collegian uh, for, for leading today's discussion. Uh, and just a, a quick note, um, for anyone interested in, in supporting uh, us with the Alumni Association uh, and, and the AIG for the Delhi Collegian, um, you're more than welcome to email us. Uh, our email is collegianaig at gmail.com uh, or check us out on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, Facebook, uh, or uh, at our website, which is psucollegianalumni.com. Uh, we're always looking for new ideas for speakers, for the different events we do for students and alumni, uh, for mentors, uh, and, and also just for other creative ideas on ways that we can add value to, uh, to the current generation of Collegian staffers. So uh, thanks again for your interest. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Jade to uh, kick off the discussion and introduce today's panelists uh, and uh, enjoy. Take it away, Jade. Cool. Thanks, Jordan. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, like Jordan said, uh, my name is Jade Campos. I am the current editor-in-chief of the Daily Collegian. Um, I'm a senior majoring in print digital journalism, and today we have five former editors-in-chief uh, joining us for the discussion. Uh, so let me get go on and introduce them. So our first um, panelist is David Jones who was the Collegian Editor-in-Chief from 1953 to 1954. He was a reporter for the Wall Street Journal for six years um, in New York and Pittsburgh, for the New York Times in Detroit and Washington for six years, and a New York Times editor for 28 years, 15 as national editor and 10 as editor of national editions, which included eight as assistant managing editor. Um, and additionally, Dave was a member of the Penn State Board of Trustees for 15 years. Um, so Dave, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, Thank you, Jay. It's fun to be here. Our next panelist is Jerry Schwartz. Uh, Jerry was the editor-in-chief in 1974 to 1975. He joined staff in a time of some turmoil when there was no candidate school, um, which is really bizarre to think about now <laughs> as an editor-in-chief. Um, he says when he walked in, he was given the choice of covering Greek life or cops, so he chose the latter. And he claims to have one of the world's shortest resumes. He worked at the Associated Press in New York as a reporter and editor since graduation and now is an editor at large. Uh, Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. Me? Um, our next panelist is Mike Abrams. Um, Mike is the Director of Journalism Practices and Principles for the New York Times, where he has worked as an editor since 2004. He was the editor-in-chief of the Daily Collision in 1993 to 94. Uh, he got a start as a reporter in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and went on to work for other newspapers in Pennsylvania and Virginia before joining the Times. And he lives in New Jersey now with his wife, Rebecca, who's also a Collegian alum, and two teenagers, and a dog named Ella. Thanks so much for being here, Mike. Thanks for having me. And our next panelist is Elena Rose who is a graduate from the class of 2020. Uh, she earned her degree in print digital journalism with minors in women's, gender and sexuality studies and global and international studies before serving as a Daily Collegian's 2019-2020 Editor-in-Chief. Elena fulfilled uh, various editing and reporting positions at the student-run outlet, discovering her strongest passions within features reporting and social media editing. And Elena now works as a junior account executive at Liv Taylor, a New York based, uh, a New York City based public relations and digital marketing agency focused on women, women and health and wellness. Thank you so much, Elena, for coming. 
for having me. I haven't been gone that long, but I'm <laughs> to be back. Of course. And Maddie Aiken is our next panelist, who is the uh, most recent editor-in-chief at the Collegian. Um, so she was the 2020-2021 editor-in-chief of the Daily Collegian. And during her time at Penn State, she majored in digital and print digital journalism and minored in political science. Maddie, it's nice to see you again. <laughs> Thank you, Jade. All right, so we're just going to get started with a simple question um, open to anybody who's interested in answering. Just kind of talk about what was your time like at the Collegian in terms of office culture, any traditions that you guys might have had, any fun that you guys might have had. Um, Dave, why don't you go ahead and answer first? Well, I don't know that we had any traditions or we didn't have any parties. Uh, we were very serious journalists. <laughs> so I'm going to pass this on to, to a more party uh, oriented uh, element because uh, I don't, I can't think of any particular traditions we have. My wife is looking in here, she was a collegiate editor also, and uh, uh, we haven't discussed this, but I, I don't think, I don't know if she can remember anything, but uh, I'll just pass it on to another editor. I'll, I'll take it from there. Uh, I, I can't say I was a party animal. In fact, I was the only teetotaler on the staff, I think, um, <laughs> which as a result, I'm the one who remembers what happened at the parties. Uh, we were, uh, take a step back from the, from the party stuff. We, we were more of a cult than a, than a, than a newspaper in a lot of ways. Uh, we had, we, we, people who spent 60 hours a week in the, in the office and then, then they hung out together. Uh, the parties were a lot of fun. Uh, we were a, a scruffy and rambunctious group. Uh, we, our parties usually ended around three in the morning with us all hanging on each other and singing Beatles songs. Uh, they, it was, it was, it was a, a good time. It's amazing to see how the standards have deteriorated since my time here. Only in those 20 years. <laughs> I think that we, we did that 60 hours in the office thing and then <clears throat> now drinking together. I, I got anybody who's on this call who was in my era knows I used to like to go to happy hour and then I was ready for a nap, uh, after <laughs> that. Um, one thing I remember also is there used to be a pizza hut up the block from the, the James um, office. And they had like a really cheap buffet for lunch and we ate way too much of really bad pizza. So that, I remember that. I can definitely say, I mean, a lot of your experiences match with ours as well. I guess things haven't really changed that much, but no, I mean, in many senses, the collegian socially just kind of follows what a lot of the other clubs do. You know, we have a formal once a semester, People who are 21, there's a bar crawl at the end of the year, Halloween parties, things like that. Um, as far as traditions go, I would definitely say Margarita's Pizza was a huge staple for people who were in the James building. And something that's kind of interesting about my time at the Collegian is I started in 2016 as a freshman and we were still in the James building then, stayed all through my junior year, moved out the first semester of my senior year. And then we moved to Midtown Square. And Midtown Square is, Oh gosh, I can't even, what is the street called now? I'm so removed, I don't remember. Um, but it's a couple blocks, by, it's right by the borough council building. Um, it's like a block back from Beaver. So the food options close to us are a little different now. I think Margarita's Pizza has lost a little bit of its grip since we moved, but uh, you know, there's Panera and all that by. So I don't know what Maddie and Jay think about that, but. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, obviously the past year, um, the traditions changed a bit at the Collegian because um, of COVID but um, we were I mean we definitely did like the 60 plus hours in the office but I think over the past year for a lot of us it was were. a lot of just staying in the office because there weren't many places to go um, but that was fun we did get to do final press run this year um, you know we got to go out a bit um, you know people would go to like downtown places to eat or bars but also it was a lot of like picking things up and bringing them back to the office um but we made it work so i don't think the camaraderie aspect has died but it definitely has changed a bit since covid hit did you guys get pewter mugs at the end of your tenure yes no we did not but i've seen them i think we always wondered what they were we weren't super <laughs> sure they were just kind of around but I'm glad you mentioned that because I don't think I would have known what that was. In my in my 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 teetotaler guides for my 21st birthday, they they brought me a pewter mug filled with milk and cookies, which I had to chug in the office. That's awesome. I love that. 
Yeah, I mean, just like Maddie said, like pretty much things have stayed, um, you know, the traditions have stayed the same, just some things are changing, a lot of picking food up and especially on print nights, everybody would kind of go out to one place and someone would get a mass order. But now we're in Willard now, so things are going to change again. I'm actually sitting in Willard right now. Um, so we just moved in last week, so we'll see what kind of traditions we pick up along the way. Um, and anybody who is in the audience, feel free to throw in questions in the chat throughout the event. Um, we're going to be doing some questions at front, but probably the last 20 minutes or so, we're going to be doing audience questions. So feel free if you have anything that pops up. Um, so our next question is, you know, there's been a lot of changes in technology in the journalism industry throughout the past few decades, um, you know, whether it's been with the collegiate print product, social media, video content, anything like that, any way that, you know, all of these guys have seen the collegiate grow um, in technology over the past, um, you know, time of their tenure at the collegiate. Um, so, Dave, I know you were talking a little bit about. No, we're not. That light has to be on. I think I, I think I should probably start with that since I could lay the foundation. Uh, I don't know what a lot of those things you were talking about are, but I'm sure my, my successors will. Uh, we had, we were in the collegian. The collegian was in the basement of Carnegie, and uh, it was in a classroom that was used until four o'clock in the afternoon, and then the doors would open and the collegian staff would file in and uh, we would put out the paper. There was a U-shaped copy desk and there's some other desks there and so forth. And we had a very high tech state of the art operation. Against two walls of the room were these little machines called typewriters. And we used to put paper in the typewriter and then you would hit the keys like you do with the computer screen and the words would appear on the paper. And then you take the paper and you'd give it to reporter or editors who would take a thing called a pencil and they would actually edit the copy with a pencil on paper. Can you imagine that, uh, how advanced that was? And then when it came time, we, had, we were printed at the Center Daily Times, which was downtown. So when it came time to transmit the copy to the printer, we had candidates for staff as runners to run the copy down. That was the, that was the uh, modern way that we ran the copy to the printer uh, and transmitted the copy. And I can't knock that because that's where I met my wife running copy to the CDT. Um, and then when down there, they had these machines called linotype machines, which were these big machines that printed little slugs of type made out of lead. And then we would put them in the thing called a chaser. We'd form them all up and we'd put the paper out. So that was the nature of the high-tech operation we had. And the most dramatic achievement of technology in my time there was when, we, when WDFM began a student radio station, which had never been heard of before. And the Collegian did the news, some of the news reports for WDFM. So that's the history of the 1950s technology scene. Great, yeah. And Mike, you were about 30, 40 years later. So how how much did that change um, during your tenure? Well, it's probably hard for most of us on here to imagine life without email, but email came to be into being when I was in college. Uh, I remember complaining about the first assignment. We all complained about the first assignment we had to file by email, which is kind of ridiculous to think about now, but uh, it was still very much a print um, system and you know we talked about whether we could redesign things and we talked about graphics and we talked about a lot of the things that that journalists today talk about i mean we very much took it seriously but it was once a day and you were done at the end of the day even if it was a really long day i think the big change in our careers really now is you can't take that audience for granted anymore it doesn't just go on a dead tree whether you like it or not it goes it goes out into the world and people will ignore it unless you can find them, unless you can reach them with the right combination of words and technology and it's really complicated. And so for some of those who followed us, I think it's become even more of a challenge. Yeah, definitely. And Matt, you were the most recent editor in chief. Um, so how has, how have all of that, those changes been implemented, especially with social media? Um, I think in the past few years, we've done a lot of building up our social media presence but also our multimedia presence um 
So during my time, we had editors posting on social media and like consistently checking what we were doing on social media. And that was really the main focus, our social media content rather than the print content, because we would more just, you know, think about the paper, like, you know, maybe like the two days leading up to it. Um, and then we were also very focused on building up our multimedia staff. Um, so, you know, we had videographers a while, for a while, but now like they've added podcasters. Um, they're really trying to build up the YouTube channel, which even though it doesn't really affect me anymore, I'll tell everybody to subscribe to the YouTube because um, we were always trying to get more subscribers. Um, and then, you know, we're trying to like, I guess approach things in a different way and not just with words, but also with photos, videos, you know, audio. Um, that was definitely something that, I mean, we were trying to be very innovative. Um, and I think as long as you're trying, then innovation will come about in some way. Yeah. And, um, you know, with all of that, one of the big things that we're working on right now, you know, moving into the next steps of social media is TikTok. So the Daily Collegian is actually on TikTok now. So if any of you guys are on TikTok, make sure you follow us. Um, and so, you know, over the past two years now, uh, the pandemic has been one of the most defining news experiences for a lot of journalists around the world. Um, so, you know, talk about some of the biggest news that's shaped your career at the Collegian. I know, Jerry, you were mentioning that when you came into journalism at the Collegian, there was a lot of turmoil going on. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, we were kind of a water, Watergate class of, of, of uh, baby boom journalists. Uh, I, you know, we took ourselves very, very seriously. Uh, it was, and also with a, a good deal, deal of irreverence at the same time, which is kind of the 1970s in a nutshell. Um, the, 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 what was going on out there, the, the president and, and leaving, the first the vice president, then the president leaving, ended up being mirrored in a, a weird thing going on in USG. Uh, there was an impeachment hearing that went on for some weeks involving the USG president. So we felt we were kind of kind of uh, following the lead of Woodward and Bernstein, uh, although I don't recall their, us breaking anything, to be honest with you. Um, we, we, had a, we had a, you know, the, the, the issues at the time locally were uh, uh, unionization, faculty unionization. Uh, it was a time of, of uh, uh, feminism and gay, and gay rights were coming to the fore in ways that they hadn't before. So it was, you know, for a place, given that, that Penn State wasn't generally a really hotbed of of radicalism or or uh, uh, you know uh, uh, campus disruption or any of that stuff there was a lot of there were a lot of things that we could cover and a lot of things that we got into and so you know it, it was um it, it was a very different time because of that although I, I suspect Penn State has gotten any more radical than it was then definitely yeah and Elena the uh, pandemic really started in the midst of your um, tenure as editor in chief. So, what was that like? Yeah, it was it was pretty wild. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking, you know, sort of going into this panel, you know, looking through operating reports that I had written for the board of directors while I was editor in chief, because I was like, I feel like all anybody cared about before the pandemic was football and basketball. And I was like, is that really true? And I went through, and it was like, yeah, all of our top ten stories were football and basketball all the time. Um, so, honestly, before the pandemic. There wasn't much crazy, Jacob Ferriott too, said in wrestling, correct, Jacob Ferriott. Um, but no, I mean, it was kind of weird because before COVID, there wasn't a lot that really happened that was, you know, super newsworthy, super buzzworthy throughout the year. And then we just kind of got like slammed with COVID march on. And I remember um, sitting in the office with Dave Eckert, who was the digital managing editor my year, and Tyler King, who was the managing editor. And Dave was like, what do we want to do about covering the coronavirus. It was so weird because what happened for us was it was really our spring break was that second week of March. And we hadn't been told yet by the university whether or not we were gonna come back. There were other schools that were saying that people should wait two weeks at home after spring break. Other people were canceling their semesters totally. Um, so it was really weird. It, it was, we didn't know anybody who had it. It was nothing like that. But it was just kind of like we don't really know what to do about it like we feel like this is going to be huge but this is so unprecedented i hate to even use the word unprecedented everyone's heard enough of that word this year but it was really weird and then that was pretty much we got into the coverage with it 
And I mean, obviously we were trying to keep up with news coverage in general, sports coverage in general, but it was like sports were being canceled. It's not like there were events that were happening and we were trying to not inundate readers with just information about COVID because obviously everyone gets tired of it. We also didn't want to worry people more than we needed to. You know, we didn't kind of want to like sensationalize things where we didn't need to sensationalize things. So it was kind of a difficult balance because we needed to write about what was important, but people weren't interested in that after a while. And we also, you know, didn't want to blow anything up. And it's tough to have that balance between being an editor and being a person where you're also freaked out about the pandemic. <laughs> And, you know, you're trying to like keep yourself down to earth and not, you know, over dramatize anything. So it was, it was a really interesting time to just kind of figure out what was sticking and what wasn't and what did we need to do because we'd never been in a situation like that before. Definitely. Yeah. And one of the big things that we found as journalists through the pandemic that was hard to um, deal with was, you know, Penn State being open about cases and just being transparent with journalists and students and the faculty um, about what was going on on campus. Um, so can you guys talk about what the relationship with the university and the collegian was like during your time? I know Maddie, you were nodding your head because we, we had to deal with transparency with Penn State and COVID. Do you want to start? Yeah, I can. Um, I, I mean, I think, I don't know how bad things were before all the Sandusky stuff happened, but from my understanding, the university became extremely tight-lipped after all of that. Um, and it was just hard because it felt like it was very hard to get information from Penn State that they didn't want to share. Um, and, you know, even if they were sharing information, they were putting their own positive spin on it or maybe not like revealing all the facts because they wanted to preserve their image. Um, and there isn't at least the way that we felt in my four years at the Collegian is that, I mean, there are ways to like go behind the university's back and then you're going to get an, like an angry email, but that's expected. But it also does feel like to some extent, like there's definitely information out there that you know you're not going to get a statement from them or they're not going to even like respond to your email sometimes um and you know because penn state isn't a public university you can't even file a right to know request um so i think you know throughout my years at the collegian we tried really hard um but i do think that penn state just has at least right now it feels like they definitely are trying to stay on top of all the different media outlets in the community. Um, and they're very much trying to, you know, keep like a certain image of themselves and any sort of bad press from us, they would get um, angry by um, and then, you know, sort of forget about the fact that we're, we're like reporting on all aspects of the community, um, you know, not just trying to report on the negative things. Um, but it definitely feels like Penn State is, um, you know, trying to prevent us from telling the full story. Well, Maddie, uh, I, had. I think you've had good experience because as you grow older in journalism, you'll find this is not an uncommon problem with institutions of all kinds. I'm not justifying Penn State's attitude, certainly, but uh, get used to it. <laughs> that, yeah, definitely. That not to to uh, sort of dump on a colleague on the uh, panel here and a former Times colleague, but what my lasting impression of the Board of Trustees was sitting there to cover it and a vote is cast and then there's the choreography of the press office handing out the releases immediately. And it's just the idea that it was a foregone conclusion. And so it you just know you're kind of being spun and you, you just, it makes you really skeptical at the least and probably jaded and cynical at the, at the worst. Well, now I think they actually released the decision the day before the vote, if I remember correctly, because I had to cover a board of trustees meeting once. So it's like, I would, I would, I would, that would, that would <laughs> I would take a step back when, 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 when I was editor of the paper, the board of trustee meetings were closed entirely. And I'm not sure whether that's, this is an improvement. I think it is to some degree, at least people are out there talking. Um, but we, I, we spent all four years I was at Penn State, it was a, a go-to uh, topic for the editorial page railing about the closed Board of Trustee meetings. Well, you know, I was on the Board of Trustees when Spander and Paterno were fired. And uh, when I joined the board in 1997, 
uh, I think it was widely viewed that I would have to, people would have to be cautious with me because I would be leaking all over the place. So I had to be very careful about how I discharged my responsibilities as a trustee uh, so as to be uh, credible with, uh, my, if I wanted to have any influence at all with other trustees, I had to be trusted by them. So it was an awkward position for me to be in. And when the when the Sandusky scandal broke, I really got put in the middle on that one. Did you ever experience any transparency issues during your time at the Collegian, Dave? Uh, we were probably too naive to recognize the transparency problems we had when when I was a sophomore, the uh, Milton Eisenhower was a relatively new president and he told the editor of the Collegian that uh, he was not going to interfere with anything that the paper wanted to print, uh, but he wasn't going to bail them out if they got into trouble for printing. And that was, I think, my experience there was that was pretty true. Nobody in my experience ever from the university ever said we couldn't print something. They might do something to, to prevent us from getting information that would enable us to print but we didn't get censorship. The biggest issue that blew up when I was editor was in my senior year, oh, excuse me, fourth year. Um, and um, and uh, questions began to be raised uh, by other students about uh, the role of Lion's Paw, which was a, a secret organization of 15 men uh, in a campus that had women. And um, uh, what, what role it was playing and so forth. And there was some suggestion and the collegian wrote about this and in fact some of the one of the women who i think is on this call was writing editorials about it uh, uh, the uh the question became one of whether the president was using lion's paw as a shadow government for the student body and whether he was uh using them to cast their votes in the student government uh, to meet the needs of the university i can't say i i can uh, spell that out in detail but that became a pretty big issue. And that was the, the biggest transparency issue we had, which was not resolved while I was, I was there. It slopped into future years. Yeah, Elena, I know you mentioned previously before um, <clears throat> our weekend started that you also experienced some kind of things going on with um, secret societies at Penn State during your time at the Collegian. Yeah, I mean, was never involved with one or anything like that. I could say that secret if it were a secret, but no, I was not involved with one. Um, but no, I mean, it was definitely a thing that people wanted to know about, that people wanted to report on. That was something that, there's another outlet at Penn State called The Underground, and The Underground wrote a story trying to sort of look into the history of secret societies, if there is any other information to uncover. So I mean, it's definitely something that people want to know about, and I think it's probably not what secret societies would uh, want attention from. I don't think they would want people in the media to be reporting on it. But yeah, I mean, it's it's always something that I think people are kind of interested in knowing more about. Oh, yeah. Well, and when, I was, when I was editor in the 50s, it was it was standard practice for Lion's Paw to tap the collegian editor. Uh, and one of the editors before me, when I was a freshman, rejected the tap, uh, as did I uh, when I was a senior or juniors for a senior year, uh, but the intervening editors and subsequent editors, at least for some time, uh, rejected the tap, accepted the tap, which I thought was a real conflict of interest for the collegian. I don't know what the practice is now. I know the Lions Post become a co-ed uh, and uh, accepts women, but how transparent it is, I'm not sure. Yeah, and Elena was mentioning that, you know, learning about Lion's Paw and other secret societies was something that a lot of students were really interested in. Um, were there any, what were like the big topics of interest to students on campus during your times um, as editors in chief? Uh, Mike, was there anything that really stood out to you? You're me. <laughs> yep, sorry. Uh, we had to have at least one person be muted. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I remember we did some cover, pretty aggressive coverage about the athletic program and whether there were um, particularly football players and I think men's basketball players getting extra benefits that other students weren't getting. For instance, the basketball team used to eat at the tavern and have a pretty nice spread. Uh, I know a lot of us at the Collegian would have liked that uh, spread. But, uh, and then the women's basketball team actually showed more outrage about that than the university administration did. Um, and there was 
a lot of scrambling on the coverage, particularly like the, the Nindy apartments or whatever they're called, where the football team lived are, are nicer than a lot of the other, or than a lot of the other on-campus housing was for the football team. And there were, there was a lot of kind of dissembling at the time that I recall that the administration did to kind of close ranks and say, no, this is all very much in line with what other programs are doing. And it is, and we're seeing that that arms race for what athletes are given has just accelerated to the point where it's, they're really professional organizations. And there are a lot of ways to make what is being um, granted the athletes standard operating procedure. Jerry, was there anything that stood out to you during your time? I would say, I would say the one, I mean, uh, the one issue that that went over all four years was was tuition, um, and and it, it looks it seems a little weird to think about that now because when I started at Penn State, I believe the tuition was about something between twelve hundred and thirteen hundred dollars a year, um, but that changed. I mean, I think over the next five years, it increased about one hundred eighty percent. Uh, it was the beginning of the defunding of, of, of state education, which is proceeds all to this day. And uh, it was it was the story, the one story that people would had got their, their hooks into. Yeah, definitely. And I know Elena was mentioning earlier about football um, being one of the biggest topics. Um, was there anything else during Elena or Maddie, your times that really was prevailing? When I went back and I sort of looked at what the top stories were of each month, I mean, like I said, it was a ton of sports, but definitely people were interested in housing too, particularly the bigger housing complexes they're making now, these like high rises that just keep popping up. And it seems like we really don't need any more because they're not even being filled. So I think that's kind of a topic that people want to know more about all the time, as do I. So that's something as well. But no, I mean, really, it was like sports, housing, COVID. That was pretty much it. Like nothing else really ever cracked the top 10 for us, typically. Yeah, I think um, for us, it was um, a lot of like COVID in the backdrop of everything. So, um, you know, like the summer I started, there was a lot going on with race reform. Um, so we really like jumped in the deep end in terms of coverage because there's a lot going on in state college. Um, and obviously that was something that we wanted to be sensitive in our reporting about. Um, and then lots of stuff with like COVID cases because Penn State, they reported cases, but they didn't provide us with as much information as other schools were providing. And they were very reluctant to, um, you know, say like, you know, where cases are happening, if there are any clusters, they wouldn't give us any of that information. Um, they wouldn't like reveal, it. there was specifically one instance where like they kept putting out press releases saying, you know, this like building in East Halls needs to get tested. Everybody needs to go get tested. This building does, these three buildings do. And eventually it was just like, they were like all of East Halls needs to get tested. And we kept saying, is there a cluster? Like have cases risen there exponentially? And they were, they got frustrated at us for publishing an editorial because they wouldn't tell us. Um, and the response that we got was, well, cases are actually just rising everywhere. And it's like, well, then why? Um, you know, are you only telling people in East Halls to get tested right now? Um, but then also there was the 2020 election to cover. Um, so lots of, you know, big news topics. And then, you know, half the time we thought sports weren't going to happen and then sports slowly started happening and then all sports started happening at once in the spring. Um, so we had a very busy semester um, amid the pandemic. Steve, was there anything for you that really jumps out to you in your memory? For me? Yeah, in terms of- Well, most of the issues that, that we were dealing with were campus issues like student housing, student parking, or with enough parking spaces, drinking in the fraternities where they had to have house, house mothers and so forth. Uh, one of the hot issues was whether women could wear Bermuda shorts on the campus, which was a very serious issue. Uh, and um, so, but that period was actually shattered by war because it was, there were still veterans from World War II on campus under the GI Bill and the uh, Korean War broke out two weeks after I uh, graduated from high school. We ran from 1950 to 1953. And some of your classmates, at Penn, our classmates, including collegiate people were being drafted. 
uh, leaving the newsroom. And uh, it was a very nerve wracking time. And of course, communists were lurking everywhere. Joe McCarthy was uh, raising all kinds of fuss. The biggest national issue we dealt with was that there was a demand in the state legislature for a loyalty oath from the faculty, demanding that they to the United States imposed that, as did Collegian. Uh, a compromise was reached, the loyalty oath was never passed. Uh, and that was perhaps the hottest national issue that, that we dealt with. Uh, Definitely. And before we get into some of the audience questions for the last 20 minutes, I just want to ask um, everybody, uh, what would you consider <clears throat> your greatest takeaways from your time at the Daily Collegian? Um, Dave, do you want us to get us started again? Well, the Collegian was seminal to my uh, growth and development as both a person and as a journalist. Uh, it gave me practical experience, which was absolutely essential to any achievement that I had uh, professionally. Uh, and it gave me a body of work that I could show to employers and, and a record of dedication to the craft, all of which I think are essential. I can't uh, overestimate the importance of the collegian in the, to the curriculum and support of the university uh, the academic program because Without a good, strong journalism program, uh, a good, strong, excuse me, a good, strong publication like the Collegian, whether it's digital or print and or both, uh, you can't have a vigorous uh, academic program for journalism. Jerry, was there anything for you? Uh, well, I, I agree with everything Dave just said, first of all. Um, it both <clears throat> journalistically and personally, it is the single most formative uh, time event of my life. Uh, I was thinking about something the other day. Uh, we, ran, we ran a story once about uh, people complaining about foreign graduate students and the uh, graduate teachers gra who were teachers teaching and about the difficulty understanding them in many cases and things like that. And we wrote a story about it. I must say, in retrospect, it was not the best story in the world. It could have used more balance than it had. Um, but as editor of the paper, uh, I got a call. There's some people who would like to come and talk to me about it. And the next thing I knew, I was in a room with about 25 people representing a veritable United Nations, entirely, extremely angry, with a reporter also who was upset by this and was at the verge of tears. And I had to talk with them. And in the course of an hour, we talked, we calmed down, we discussed what needed to be done. And I don't know how I ever would have had that kind of experience any, in any other way when I was in college. And it has served me every single day of my life. And, you know, the, and, and this doesn't even get to the, the, the question of the, the lifelong friends, I, I, friendships that I developed, um, people who I would walk through hell with for. Um, you know, it, it just was the best thing I ever did. Mike, what about you? Uh totally agree with everything you guys are saying. I mean, the most um, important professional, personal experience I ever had in my life, that we took it very seriously, but it made me personally a better student. Uh, it gave me a calling and a sense of purpose and a career. It, I met my wife, I met friends from there. I learned how to be a colleague, how to be a reporter, how to be an editor. I, I made mistakes and learned how to mop up from them, which that never ends in your career. You we all make mistakes and we have to learn to, to overcome that. And the idea that you can do that independently um, and make your own mistakes and then go out the next day or whenever on campus and see and hear people talking about what you did and it changed the way they live their lives. Uh, th there's, there are very few things in the world that can have that kind of impact. So I, I'll never forget my time at the Collegian and I'll, I'll never regret it. Elena? a loaded question. Um, I could go <laughs> a bunch of different routes, um, but no, I mean, it sounds kind of cheesy, but I literally do not think I would know who I was without the collegian. I started at my high school newspaper and I knew I liked it, but you just have no idea what you're going to learn whenever you get there. And that's learning what you love. It's learning what you don't love. Um, I've made so many friends there people who I love very dearly. I think that there are so many places where you can really learn and grow and thrive if you wanna be a journalism student at Penn State, but 
I just think the collegian does it like no one else. And I mean, something that I haven't really gotten to touch on much is like, I also feel super fortunate about the time that I was there because when I entered as a freshman, we were still printing five days a week. And by the time I was done as a senior, I mean, we technically weren't really printing at all because of COVID, but you know, we were printing twice a week and we were just way more focused on digital. And you cannot get that digital and kind of online physical experience that you get at the Collegian at any of the other outlets. It's just really cool to kind of conquer two different beasts and learn from that and work with a business division too. I mean, that's so underrated um, just in terms of, you know, learning how to be a better leader, a better communicator. Um, yeah, there's just such a wealth of experience. I wouldn't be where I am or doing what I'm doing now without it, no question. Patty? Yeah, I mean, I think to echo what everybody said, I think, um, you know, the collegian definitely, it introduced me to journalism actually, because my high school didn't have a paper. Um, and I changed my major to journalism because I enjoyed it so much at the collegian. Um, but I think specifically, it, um, it really became, you know, the place at Penn State where I formed, um, you know, really deep friendships. I was always really excited to go into the office. Um, uh, you know, it feels like when I think about my time at Penn State, I think about the classes, um, you know, after I think about the collegian, just because, um, you know, in classes, I, you know, you maybe like write a few articles and, you know, you get lectures where you're told how to do things, but at the collegian, you really don't get like the newsroom culture. You don't have to make any big decisions in classes. You don't actually face usually ethical dilemmas in classes. Um, and you don't get any sort of, you know, management or leadership experience. Um, so I'm very grateful for my time at the Collegian because of that, but also because I think there's a really good culture there right now. And I think, um, you know, it felt good to have friends there, but also, you know, as an upperclassman, make people feel welcome and make people feel like they had a place at Penn State. Yeah, definitely. I agree with all of that. And I'll say one thing for me is that, um, Pretty much everybody will stay until like midnight or like one o'clock in the morning but it never feels like work you're just kind of there and like hanging out with your friends and you could on it we've had people stay till five o'clock in the morning but <laughs> that's a different story um jordan i know that there was a powerpoint did we want to get into that before the questions or yeah if you want I'll, I'll do i can um quickly just do a quick uh let's see little buzz through here of some so we, we pulled uh, for all of our attendees, we, we, uh, we pulled together some images here um, uh, of it's just a, it's a mixed bag so, uh, of, of time. So I'm just going to quickly go through and, and if any panelists certainly want to comment, not that we have anyone here from 1887, but um, this, this sort of covers the early days of the Collegian. Uh, there's some cool headlines in here uh, and, and some, some, great, uh, some great imagery as well. Um, and so uh, I'll just I'll just click through if anyone wants me to stop at a certain point because a specific headline that we've already covered uh, or that we haven't covered jumps out. Feel free to do so, but sort of gives you a feel for how uh, the, the Collegian has been that chronicle of what's happened both in Penn State life and also the world. I know there's at least one here that we're going to get a we'll get a quick anecdote out of Dave on for sure. I don't think it's Bermuda shorts, although that Dave, now that you're back, there is a question as to when when the Bermuda shorts were approved. I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was while I was there. Interesting to know too, when we when we were sort of prepping for today. Not only obviously the name and you know the the header itself, but um, even even the you know even the uh, slogan or tagline you know here for the Daily Collegian for a better Penn State. You know the, this is here in 1954, but that will change as you see as we get closer. And of course the ads, print ads for sure. <laughs> Campbells. Campbells. There she is, that's my wife on the right. <laughs> we planted this, we got, we got a couple personal photos in here. Dave, you want this one? 
Yep, that's ours. That was a big day. Sorry, a couple of these are a little bit low res. Hey. We used to print that. Looks like a stock ticker. You only had 11,000 students, so. PG rated session, I'm gonna keep going. Obviously the logo has changed now. It's the weekly collegiate ad. That was us. <laughs> yep. This is my era. Just one or two more. Yep. Here. I'll, I'll point out again that that's my byline on that story. <laughs> yeah, good point. This one, yep. Which you did not realize, right, at the time? Uh, I didn't realize what? That, it, that, the, that the collegian ran it? <laughs> yeah, right. Or like, it, it was kind of at the back of my, uh, yeah, bottom of my list at the moment. But sure, you had, you had more pressing. Other there. things going on. Yeah. We all did. Jerry, I think you and, and um, Charles Bierbauer were like the most famous journalists who visited us when, when I was at the collegian. That, that's a really sad commentary, but thanks, Mike. <laughs> most important part page there you go and that's that's uh that's the end of, of what we've got image wise jada you may have caught it already but um looks like there were some a couple of questions in the chat that, that i caught that might be interesting one one was about diversity um uh, you know from from everyone's era diversity of the staff um and also a question about what people sort of went on to do after tdc um so like did those who were you know, reporters and editors go on to journalism careers, or have we seen that sort of change? I, I can throw in something about diversity. Uh, it was always a struggle. It was a huge struggle. Uh, and something when I was editor and the people who were editors on either side of, of my time, we, tr we tried very hard to get people to join uh, of uh, other than white kids. Uh, part of that was a... Uh, Part of it was just Penn, Penn State. I mean, it was not the most diverse place in the 1970s to begin with. But there was also a carryover from an incident that happened, I think, in 1971, in which a collegian reporter, a white collegian reporter, who was thrown out of a meeting of a uh, Black activist group, uh, eavesdropped, wrote the story, and uh, it caused all, all hell broke loose. Uh, Hundreds of copies of the Collegian disappeared the next day, uh, and were I, I think were burned somewhere. Uh, there was a, a huge thing where the the board of directors of Collegian Incorporated uh, fired the editor and the reporter for the last couple weeks of the of the term, uh, and it caused in in Pennsylvania journalism uh, 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 it was a it was a cost lab, and the and New Pennsylvania Newspaper Publishers Association investigated it and everything else. Put, it, put all that aside, it made it even harder to get uh, blacks to, to, to join the staff. 
and we tried and we were terribly unsuccessful with it. We had no racial diversity at the Collegian when I was there, and I don't know that there was ever a serious thought about doing it. But one of the most remarkable things was in 1954, Jesse Arnell, who was an athlete, was black, was elected uh, student body president of the university, which for 1954 was a pretty remarkable event because it was just the beginnings of the civil rights movement. I was just gonna say, um, diversity is definitely still a struggle. The staff is still predominantly white. Um, and that's <laughs> definitely something that, you know, we were thinking about during my tenure and um, I'm sure during Elena's tenure too. Um, I do think that, I, I we don't have any solid numbers, but I am, at least I know the Collegian is much more diverse um, as I left it than when I joined. Um, so I assume that it's the most diverse that it has been, but I know one thing that we were focusing on um, during my tenure was, you know, not only recruitment, you know, we tried to recruit, you know, as many people as possible from, you know, different majors, different backgrounds, reaching out to different organizations and clubs, just to try to get the name out, but also focusing on our actual content, um, you know, making sure that we were being sensitive with all of our reporting so that people wouldn't feel like the Collegian was just a student newspaper for certain students, but for all students. Um, so that's definitely one of our focuses, but it definitely still is, um, you know, an issue that the Collegian faces as I'm sure most, you know, college newspapers and actual newspapers are facing right now as well. Yeah, I think going off of what Maddie said too, such a huge part of it is having a staff that actually cares about having racial diversity. <laughs> like, I mean, if people don't care about it, it's not something that people are going to be actively looking out for when they're editing stories, when they're writing stories, when they're coming up with story ideas, you know, when they're putting a staff together. So that's something that I think has gotten really important, especially over the past couple of years, because it's like, if you don't care, you don't really belong on staff. Um, but I mean, diversifying our staff is something that the collegian is always going to have to work on. I mean, we are the student newspaper and student run media outlet at a predominantly white institution um, that this paper and this outlet has a history of being run pretty much by white people. Um, so, I mean, it's just always going to be something that like, we're going to have to continue to reach out to organizations to listen really hard to what people have to say, um, to figure out how to be better and to not be sensitive about it because we're not, serving the community if we're not actually you know hearing all the voices that need to be heard inviting them to be part of our staff making them feel like they can feel comfortable on our staff um, because i mean there are definitely things that have happened um racially insensitive with the collegian and sometimes you know it's accidents that people make or you know maybe it's editorials that have aged over time that you know are racist in essence now and you know we can see that and recognize it but yeah, I mean, there's been hurt that's definitely been caused over the years. And it's just something that you're always gonna have to work on, you know, listening and making sure that people can trust you with covering their stories. Like that's the whole point of being a journalist is that, you know, you want sources to be able to trust you and know that, you know, you are smart enough that you pay enough attention to actually cover what they're saying, so. Yeah, and something to um, Jake's point that he just put in the chat, Jake Ferriot, who just graduated. Um, I know that part of the question was about um, diversity in terms of women and men on staff as well. Um, and I will say, you know, recently, I there's definitely a lot more women on staff than there are men, which is probably not true um, to how the Collegian used to be, um, especially a lot of women in leadership roles. Um, and one of the other questions that Jordan um, said, uh, earlier was that we got in the chat was about how many people on staff actually entered into the journalism industry after leaving the collegiate. Uh, um, so if anybody wants to answer. I could take that one. I, I think uh, quite a few people from our era in the 90s really did go into journalism. And of course, a lot of the paths that many of us took have crumbled rapidly behind us. Uh, I, there's still quite a few people who are sticking it out or hanging on for dear life. Um, but I think a lot of people went into other lines of work, whether it was marketing or public relations, um, some healthcare, I think. I, I think the one thing everybody has in common though is the ability to communicate clearly, the ability to write, 
the ability to edit other people's writing. I mean, that you need that in every field. And it's just amazing to me how, uh, how difficult it is for a lot of people to communicate. And so that's another thing that Collegian can do for you. I don't know if it's useful for me to say this um, right now. I don't know if it's my turn, but I did take a gap year post COVID times. So I graduated in May of 2020 um, and I just finished up my gap year about a month ago. So I just started my first job recently and I'm working in public relations and digital marketing. And honestly, I don't think that's what I thought I would have been doing a year ago, but I, I just think that something that I really valued when I was editor in chief, honestly, was working on social media and analytics and, you know, putting together operating reports for the board of directors and, you know, moments like that where communications is really so vast. And I think that's something that journalism students are getting way more of a taste of now, especially because we're kind of veering off from print. It's like, what are all of the options to communicating with people? Is it through an Instagram story? You know, is it on Facebook? Is it on Twitter? Is it through a TikTok? And I think that's really busting the door open for people to get more involved in social media and maybe, you know, pursue careers in that, or for people to get involved in, you know, more of the marketing side, because they're seeing all these other modes of communication that they have access to. So I think that's definitely something for me that I knew, I knew I wanted to get to New York City and um, I wanted to have a salary that I could live on. So that's uh, part of the reason I went PR as well. But you know, yeah, I just think that communications is expanding even further and further now and the options for what you can do with it are so far beyond, you know, even if you major in journalism to go other paths as well. So not, I'm not leaving journalism behind forever, I don't think, but I, I think we're taking a pivot at the moment, so. Of um, the seniors who just graduated, I think the majority of those who have jobs did get them in journalism, but I feel like we also are seeing more people go into PR or, you know, social media based jobs. Um, I haven't announced anything, but I plan on going into journalism and the managing and editor under me is also in journalism right now. But the other member of the top three, the digital managing editors in social media right now. Um, and I will also say that at least, at least for me and the vibe that I'm getting now is that when people are younger, they're very much like, I'm never going to go into PR or any sort of communications field. I need to be in journalism. And by the end of my time as editor in chief, I was much more open to PR and I still am now. I want to try out journalism because I still like, like love it. Um, but it's definitely something that I could see myself doing now. Whereas, you know, four years ago, I would have been like, I don't want to do that. Um, and I think at least the vibe I get is that a lot of the people on staff are the same. Um, and, you know, some people try out the collegian and they just decide that journalism isn't for them at all anymore. Um, so, yeah. And if anyone's looking for a job, I think one just got posted in the chat. So, you know, not only do we share memories, we also plant people at, at, their, at their first jobs. Look at that. I do think, and, and uh, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it because I know we're coming to the top of the hour, but the, the, the skills and the experiences, obviously, that everyone on our panels talked about, uh, I think, open doors today because of just the, the fractured you know, work environment that we have. It, the, there are opportunities. The, the, all the things that um, you, you learn and gain in your years of the collegian, you can take in a plethora of different directions these days, you know, from, you know, in-house at a brand to, to whatever a publisher today means, because kind of everyone's a publisher, whether you're an individual, a company, a, you know, a true publisher, an entertainment company, et cetera. So it's, uh, you know, it's scary, but at the same time, it, you know, there's, there's all this great opportunity. Um, I'm getting the one minute warning from Shar. So I'll just, I'll thank all of our panelists again. Um, Jay did a great job. Thanks, Dave, Jerry, Maddie, Elena, Mike. Uh, really appreciate you coming together for this. Thanks for everyone who attended. I know there's going to be an on-demand version of this uh, that will get posted and disseminated. So we really appreciate it. Thanks for pulling it together. Thanks for all the questions uh, and uh, support the Collegian. They need it and we appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.